Hidden in the mountains from the Muslim invasion, the emperors and priests of Ethiopia kept the Christian faith alive. Here in the 12th century, the emperor Lalibela carved out of the rock the churches of what he hoped would be a new Jerusalem. It was the empire's capital for a hundred years and came to be known as Lalibela after its creator. 800 years later, Haile Selassie was to come here to pray for deliverance from Italy's invasion of his country. At the worst moment of his life, it was his way of declaring his ultimate faith in the God who was so essential to his empire's tradition, a tradition that the monks of Lalibela still voice in a haunting mixture of orthodox plain chant and African rhythm. struggle with Islam, church and state became inseparable, and the Christian powers of Europe sent emissaries to the emperors to help them against the Muslims. One of them may have been Prester John, some Western Father Jean, perhaps, exiled and forgotten here for a lifetime. But in spite of Western help, many of the empire's provinces were overrun. The emperors themselves became nomads, wandering the highlands from camp to camp until here at Gondar in the 17th century, they came to rest again in renewed splendor. These castles of Gondar are unique in Africa. Probably some Portuguese helped to build them, possibly Indian craftsmen were brought in. But they're a sign of Ethiopia's special distinction in Africa as a place where the non-African world made some early mark on the continent. Gonda was only a brief revival of a declining empire. In another hundred years, the court was on the march again, still carrying the Christian banner, but challenged at every step by powerful feudal barons, as the kings of medieval England used to be. Only the church held Ethiopia together, and gradually authority shifted again towards the church strongholds in the central mountains. Here, the empire that Haile Selassie would inherit began to take shape under King Sahli Selassie his great-grandfather. King Sahli was one of the most powerful barons, and it was to him that the new commercial empires of 19th century Europe came with their gifts and guns. And his kingdom was the foundation on which the Ethiopian empire was rebuilt. Its revival was heralded by a Christian crusade led by a man who was half monk, half warrior, and who defeated all other contenders for the throne, the Emperor Theodore. But in 1862, Theodore fell foul of Queen Victoria. By a misunderstanding, she failed to answer one of his letters, and in a huff, Theodore imprisoned a British consul and some European missionaries in his mountain fortress at Magdala. When five years of diplomacy failed to secure their release, the British at last sent a military expedition to recover them. It was a ponderous exercise, but effective. With elephants, gun carriages and Indian sepoys under the command of General Napier, they clambered steadily into the mountains that had been Ethiopia's best defence for so long. The Ethiopians were no match for them. They had few rifles and no artillery to save their old empire from the new world. As Napier's army approached their last stronghold, Theodore shot himself. The new concept of empire had triumphed over the old. 
Yet in Theodore's medieval crusade, there was a glimpse of a new Ethiopia. And 20 years later, under the Emperor Menelik, grandson of Sahli Selassie and half-uncle to Haile Selassie, that glimpse became something like reality. Europe's scramble for Africa was then in full swing, and as the Western empires planted their flags all over the continent, only Menelik's Ethiopia seemed able to stand against them. At Addis Ababa in Sahli Selassie's old kingdom, Menelik created a new capital for his empire. It was Ethiopia's first permanent capital since the heyday of Gonda, 200 years before. Menelik's palace is still used 80 years later by Haile Selassie, and to him it's a permanent reminder of the day when Ethiopia showed that it could, after all, resist the power of Europe, when Menelik's army in these mountains defeated an Italian invasion at the Battle of Adawa. The year was 1896, and the traditional Ethiopian painting tells the story of a modern awakening. <laughs> It was the first time a European army had been defeated by Africans since Hannibal beat the Romans 2,000 years ago. Menelik's celebrations were huge and noisy. For days on end, the drink ran like water and the tables were red with the blood of raw meat. In the rejoicing, the Ethiopians hardly noticed that they had still to pay a price for their independence. From now on, they would be enmeshed in the quarrels of the European powers. While the new ambassadors and their lady wives looked with astonishment at Menelik's medieval feasts, they were secretly seeking for allies here in the power struggle that was raging in Europe. Into this strange twilight world between yesterday and today, Haile Selassie was born. Now, after 80 years, he looks back on a lifetime that has spanned the gap between the 2,000 years of African tradition he inherited and our own jet-propelled international revolution that threatens to overwhelm him. One of his earliest memories is of the way our world first encroached on his, with the arrival in Ethiopia of the first British diplomatic mission to the court of his half-uncle Menelik, he was five years old. The year was 1897, just a year after the great victory of Adawa, and the British mission on its way to Addis Ababa stayed with the young Haile Selassie's father in the town of Harar. Harar then was a newly conquered province of Menelik's empire, taken from Muslim hands. Haile Selassie's father, Ras Makonnen, was Menelik's governor for Harar and a favorite to succeed to the throne. In Muslim hands, Harar had been a secret city, closed to non-Muslims for centuries. Forty years earlier, the British explorer Richard Burton had only been able to get here disguised as an Arab. He didn't think much of what he saw. The streets were stony and narrow, the faces were stern and secretive. He thought they justified the local proverb, hard as the heart of Harar. 